from Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. And just as a reminder, I told you this a few weeks ago, um, there are two of the apostles that uh, recount the nativity story in the New Testament. One is Luke, and the other is Matthew. And Luke tells it from the perspective of Mary, and Matthew tells it from the perspective of Joseph. And so this is our scripture this morning, Matthew 1, verses 18 through 25. This is how Jesus the Messiah was born. His mother Mary was engaged to be married to Joseph. But before the marriage took place, while she was still a virgin, she became pregnant through the power of the Holy Spirit. Joseph, to whom she was engaged, was a righteous man and did not want to disgrace her publicly. So he decided to break the engagement quietly. As he considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. Joseph, son of David, the angel said, Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the child within her was conceived by the Holy Spirit. And she will have a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All of this occurred to fulfill the Lord's message through his prophet. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We've talked about the wonder of the star of Bethlehem, the wonder of Jesus' name, and last week, the wonder of the manger. And this morning, we're going to talk about the wonder of the promise that was delivered through the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, born in Bethlehem. Sadly, many people within the body of Christ don't believe that God still speaks to and through his people today. They put limitations on God that better fit within their understanding of who he is and how he operates. It is based solely on their own personal experience. As if our infinite God is confined to or limited by our personal experience. I suppose they believe if, if they haven't experienced God speaking to them, it must be impossible that anyone would experience it. They have forgotten what Malachi 3 verse 6 tells us, I am the Lord and I do not change. God still speaks to and through his people. And he is very often, he very often does that through dreams. The apostle Matthew's retelling of the nativity story describes an angel of the Lord delivering a very important message to Joseph through a dream. It may be hard for us to wrap our minds around how we could have an actual encounter with an angel in a dream. But this is the reality of how our God operates. There's just going to be some things that don't make sense to us. <laughs> like how a virgin could have a child. <coughs> our God is not constrained by our conscious or unconscious state. And the sooner we grasp and take hold of this truth, the sooner 
we will begin to live fully into how he desires us to operate as kingdom ambassadors while here on this earth. Now before this dream took place, Joseph had promised to take Mary as his wife. And he was considering breaking that promise. Now, back in this uh, era that Mary and Joseph lived in, an engagement didn't involve just a ring on a finger. An engagement was a whole process. And it went on for about a year before the couple was actually betrothed in marriage and consummated the marriage. Being engaged was a legal commitment, a commitment of the heart. I mean, today, if you get engaged and you break out your engagement, you just call it off. You just say, we're not going to do that. But in this particular time, in this particular culture, even to be engaged would call for a divorce. So Joseph was considering breaking the promise he had made to take Mary as his wife. That is, until he had this extraordinary dream where an angel of the Lord told him to keep his promise to Mary. Why? Because there was an even more important promise that needed to be kept. It involved a lot more than two people who were betrothed to each other. And at the center of this other great promise was the unborn child in Mary's womb. This promise was the promise of eternal life for all who would receive this newborn king as their savior. Matthew describes Joseph as a righteous man. This means in part that he knew and observed the laws of his Jewish faith. But he also seems to have been a really good, kind, and honorable man. When Joseph found out that Mary, to whom he was betrothed or engaged, was pregnant, oh, he knew. <laughs> He was not the father. So of course, he assumed what seemed obvious to him at the time, that she was unfaithful. Now back in those days of Joseph and Mary, things, as I said, they weren't like they are today. And when someone in a marriage or even a commitment to be marriage in that whole engagement period of a year is really a beautiful process if you ever delve in and study uh, Jewish matrimony and all they did and, and how the, the husband-to-be would go and take a piece of his family's property and build a house for him and his wife and he just spent that whole year preparing to take his wife in where it says the husband and uh, wife will leave their father and mother and come together and cleave in one. And he would spend that whole year preparing to take his new bride. But if someone committed adultery, they were not allowed to be with each other during that whole time, be clear. They were not allowed to physically be with each other that whole period of engagement. But if they were with somebody else, that was bad news. That meant that they would have to get divorced and suffer the consequences for adultery. Adultery was against the law. It was an act that ended the marriage and could be punishable by death. So there were some serious concerns regarding this unexpected pregnancy. Both Joseph and Mary risked public scorn. We usually only talk about the possibility of this for Mary, but men were not allowed, as I said, to be intimate with their wives either. So both of them, it would have looked like, had broken the law. Knowing this, he could have 
totally thrown her the proverbial wolves. I mean, he could have thrown her under the bus because he wasn't the father. He knew she wasn't the father. She knew he wasn't the father. Most men would have been so enraged, so insulted, and humiliated that they would have insisted in that time Mary be stoned to death or at very, the very least punished and publicly humiliated. How humiliating for a man to find out his soon-to-be wife is pregnant, knowing it wasn't his. It was messy and ugly and quite upsetting. And here we have Joseph, who was a kind and loving man. And he loved Mary so much even though he believed that she had been unfaithful, he loved her so much, he was going to do anything he can, could to spare her public humiliation or worse. It's an extraordinary fellow. So he chose to dismiss her quietly Try to defuse the situation. But then one night, after he had made up his mind on how to handle the situation with as much love and grace as he could muster up in his shattered heart, he has this strange, amazing dream. And in this dream, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and in so many words says, Joseph, don't abandon Mary. Stand by her. She's not pregnant by another man. Nothing ordinary has caused her pregnancy. She's pregnant only because the Holy Spirit of the living God in a mystical and miraculous manner has caused her to become pregnant. I know you don't understand it. It's not for you to understand. But she will bear a son from this mysterious union of spirit and flesh. And you're to name the child Jesus, which means God saves. And he will save God's people from their sins. Now this was a most unusual, vivid, and incredible dream, but still, it was a dream. We've all had dreams that were so vivid, they seemed real. I'd love to sit down with you sometime and, and tell you some of the just extraordinary dreams the Lord has given me that, that spoke into my circumstances and even things to come, and he, he still does those things. But even after a very realistic dream, when we wake up, we know that as real as the dream might have seemed when we were having it, it was in fact just a dream. But Joseph knew in the core of his being that this dream really was a God dream. And he decided to change his plans. He decided to be obedient and not in his relationship with Mary. He knew in the depths of his heart this dream was a message from God. And because of this dream, instead of making the choices that were driven by saving face or protecting his own reputation or driven by political correctness or a cultural code, Joseph made a choice driven by his faith in God. And because of his choice, he was changed. He was transformed. Not just on the inside, but the outside. His heart changed. His world changed. 
the world changed. He found himself awakened to the possibilities, possibilities he never imagined before. He was reminded that God is God, and what might seem impossible, and even in this particular situation, unbelievable, is always possible with God. Through this divine dream, Joseph was pulled into this extraordinary love story we celebrate at Christmas. That's what it is, a love story. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. Because of this dream, where he had an encounter with a heavenly angel, Joseph, Joseph became a promise keeper instead of a promise breaker. And he fulfilled his role in the plan for our redemption, which was orchestrated by the greatest promise keeper of all, our God, the creator of the universe. You see, Joseph was a direct descendant of King David. And I'm sure when Joseph, like Mary and all the other faithful Jews, heard about the, the prophecies of the Messiah being born from the lineage of King David, he never imagined that he would be the connecting link. He was the descendant of King David, not Mary. Yet he was not the biological father. Only God. <laughs> Only God. His ways are higher than our ways. And because Joseph kept his promise to stay with Mary and be her husband and this, and this unborn child's stepfather, he fulfilled one of the most amazing heavenly destinies of all time. <clears throat> Promise keeping. It's a really big deal. You know, it really bothered me as a young mother not to be able to keep promises to my kids. And there were sometimes there would be things that were just unavoidable that would make all the plans go south and I'd have to let them down for something and it just, it was just awful. I don't like that. I've heard people say how often they miss the days when you could simply take someone's word for an agreement or a promise. You know, I give you my word and that's good enough. You don't need a notarized legal document. I give you my word. It's a sad thing that that doesn't hold anymore. I miss those days too. We live in a modern day culture where everyone is so accommodating to one another to not be accountable for keeping their word. We just give everybody excuses all the time. As Tom and I celebrate our 12th wedding anniversary today, I'm reminded of how important it is to keep our promises to one another and to our Father. When we got married, we didn't just promise to honor one another until death do us part. We promised it to God. In this world, it makes it so easy for you to break that promise of marriage. Divorce is the easy choice. Staying married is the difficult choice a lot of the time, even in the best marriage. Relationships are challenging. <laughs> no matter how much you love each other, the difficult, honorable choice is always to keep your promise. If it's a good, healthy marriage, of course, I don't mean if it's a, a dangerous situation. You know, it's just in today's world, when we overlay today's society to the society that Joseph and Mary were in, you know, today it's just, it's easier to walk away from a marriage than to work things out. It's easier to hold grudges than it is to forgive. 
It's easier to blame the other rather than admit you're at fault too. It's easier to become complacent than it is to keep passion alive intentionally. It's easier to grow bored with one another than to really make the effort to see your spouse with fresh eyes every day and remember all the things you love about them and all of the wonderful qualities they have and how that truly does outweigh those annoying ones. <laughs> it's a choice. Choosing to keep promises, it often costs us. It means making, choosing this person or this situation or choosing our commitment to God over other things. It requires something from us. But the reward reward is always worth it. And Joseph demonstrates this. He made that decision that I bet there wouldn't be one person outside of Mary's family maybe. <laughs> there wouldn't be one person in their community or his family that would have said that's a good idea. <laughs> Stay with the pregnant girl who's been unfaithful. I bet he would not have gotten one vote of support. He went against the grain. He went against all those doubts and voices in his head and the doubts in his heart of what really was going on. And he kept his promise. And because of that, he helped bring in the greatest promise of all. By him keeping his promise, he connected with God keeping his. What an honor. Have you ever considered, even though none of us are Joseph, have you ever considered that how we act in our relationships and, and in being people of our word and truly committed and faithful and keeping our promises, have you ever considered that that just might be something the Lord is counting on because he has a greater thing in store for you or someone else? Maybe if that couple actually stays together and keeps their promises, some child is going to be born that's a great prophet or a preacher or a president. Lord knows we need one. <laughs> Seriously. There's impact. There's impact. When we consider the wonder of the star of Bethlehem that was in the sky over 2,000 years ago, we notice that in the most unlikely places, with the most unlikely people, in the most unlikely and unfavorable political climate, God reached down from heaven and pierced through the darkness of this world. The light of the sky, the star, was prophetic. It pointed to biblical prophecy being fulfilled and that the glorious light of Christ was piercing through the darkness of this earthly realm as the greatest gift we would ever be given. He was born to give us hope. Hope that we so desperately need. And we're reminded that no matter what is going on in this world, no matter what evil is threatening us, no matter how uncertain things are in our economy, nothing can stop what God has planned, and his plans for us are always good for those who love him. When we consider the wonder of a name given to the Christ child, which was Jesus in English, Joshua in Greek, and Yeshua HaMashiach in Hebrew, we learn the importance of his name, which means the Lord of salvation, our God saves. We desperately needed a Savior then, and we need one now. 
The good tidings the angels were speaking of when they encountered the shepherds in the fields, those lowly shepherds that no one wanted to come near because they lived out on the outer fringes of society with the animals. They were a rough crew. But that's who the angels went to. That's who God gave the first message of the birth of Jesus. And it reminds us that he sees us all. It doesn't matter what other people think of us. It doesn't matter whether they recognize us or they validate us or they think we're worthy or important or good enough. All that matters is God sees us. He sees us all. And he loves us the same. From the lowly shepherds to the highest kings, we're all the same to, to Jesus. This is the wonder of Christmas. This is the wonder of the name above all names. The star, Jesus' name, the manger, the promise. all about God being here with us, Emmanuel. And the wonder of Christmas is that when we accept his son Jesus Christ as our Savior, we can claim that promise for eternal life and know that it's ours. Let us pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, Reignite in us the wonder of Christmas this morning. Help us to be the people you call us to be. People filled with wonder on how wonderful you are, how loving you are, how good you are. And you see us all. When people reject us or pass us by or they think that we don't measure up or don't fit in or whatever the case is, Father. It's what you think about us that matters. And you loved us so much and still do that you sent your only son, Jesus, born in a manger so that he could die on the cross in our place. And we thank you. It's in his name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen.